Good afternoon all and welcome to the Psychology Curse Caroline session uh, today on Thursday the 18th of March. Uh, I'm going to hand you over now to Miss Bellis who will uh, facilitate the session. Thank you Miss. Thank you. Hi everyone. Okie dokie. So just a little overview of what has been covered so far in these sessions and what we're going to be looking at today. So in session one, we looked at the ethical costs of conducting research. That was presented by myself. And then in session two, we looked at the cultural bias in psychology, which was presented by Mr Mackay. Um, and today we are going to look at the scientific status of psychology. It's one of the controversies of your unit three and I'm going to help you formulate the debate. And then the next week in our last session, we will cover sexism in psychology. And again, you will have some more information on how to formulate the debates. So just an overview um, again of what the unit um, looks like. You have section A, which is the study of behaviours, where you should have looked at three different behaviours in depth. And then section B in this unit are the controversies. They are a um, specification requirement and we need you to put all of your information that you've learned throughout two years of study in psychology into these essay questions. So like I said before, today we are focusing on the scientific status. Um, we're going to look at the benefits of it being um, a science, the changing nature of science, the costs of it being a science, and then we're going to have a look at the various methodologies used across the approaches. OK, I used this slide in my last session, so I won't stay too long here, but this is just an overview of what a controversy is. It's quite nice to bring this in um, your introduction to an essay. So it is a disagreement on a matter of opinion. It's a debate, essentially. But there is no clear answer to the controversy. It is something that you can provide evidence for and against and you can come to a conclusion but there is no final resolution, okay? So there's no clear answer. The part of the specification, like I said before, allows you to draw upon your knowledge that you've gained throughout your psychology course. You can use things that you've done in AS, you can do um, sections from research methods, you could use um, information and evidence from the different behaviours you've looked at as well. So it's quite nice that you can round everything up that you've learned and really show off your knowledge um, when answering a question like this. All right, so scientific status then. This is an example of what a paper would look like. You would get two questions, both 25 marks, um, both on a different controversy. Um, the top question is obviously what we're going to look at today with psychology as a science and the bottom question is um, an example of something to look at when we do a sexism. So the question here says for psychology to have an impact, it is necessary for psychology to be a science. Evaluate the validity of this statement. Now, something myself and Mr Mackay have both gone through in these sessions is the importance of referring your question, uh, referring your essay back to that question and constantly making sure that you are referring to the question at multiple points throughout your essay. So this question is not only a little quotation, it's also asking you to evaluate the validity and that is something that you need to make sure you're referring back to with every point that you make. So is psychology a science? This is quite a big debate and um, I often get into quite a heated debate with the science department in school because we have uh, physicists, biologists and uh, chemists and they say that they are uh, the three sciences and psychology is not a science. 
But we know from studying psychology closely that there are lots of scientific elements of psychology. There's lots of things that are unscientific as well. Um, and it's a very common argument and a, a very common debate that people have. So what we need to be able to do is generate some arguments for and some arguments against. All right, so what is science then? It's defined as a system of acquiring knowledge based on observation and experimentation to describe and explain natural phenomena. Now, looking at that statement, we know that in psychology they use observations and uh, experimentation. You have studied observations and experiments uh, throughout your whole course. It says here the, the general scientific approach can be said to have the following features in common. Now these three key terms are probably terms that you have um, come across quite a lot in your studies. You've got objectivity, falsifiability and replicability. So science subjects should be free from personal views and subjective feelings. Now we know that psychology can often be very subjective, especially within your positive approach and um, lots of researchers have included their own personal view. So there's quite an argument between objectivity and psychology. Then you've got falsifiability. So theories should be able to be proved or disproved. And then you've got replicability, so methods that can be replicated by others. So that's bringing in your reliability element when you look at research methods here. Does psychology meet this criteria? That is something that you will have to discuss and bring into your argument here in this essay. Some elements of psychology are clearly scientific. We know about the biological approach, the use of laboratory experiments. However, other aspects are more difficult to describe as scientific. Case studies, studies such as Watson and Rainer's Little Albert study. The psychodynamic approach, Freud, Freudian theory. Is it scientific? Does it have a scientific element or is it all subjective? Now, what I've put on the screen here um, are some examples of studies and theories that you can bring into this essay. So the studies you've got are from the AS um, unit. So you've got Rain with the uh, murderers and their brains. You've got Loftus and Palmer, Milgram, Pavlov, Skinner. And then I've also popped in some um, of the studies that are also brought in to ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder. Now, if autism is not one of the behaviours that you've learned in school, then that's not a problem. You are, and you will be aware of um, other behaviours and other studies that you can bring into your answer here. And then in the theories um, column, again, we've also got some from ASD. So we've got amygdala dysfunction. That's also within your um, biological um, section of crime. You've got genetic explanations. I know that there are ge genetic explanations in every single behaviour, so you can bring that in. And then the dopamine hypothesis, which is obviously used within schizophrenia. So it doesn't really matter what behaviours of the six you, your school has decided to teach you, what three of the six, they can all be used and brought into this study, which is quite nice really, because well, it's one, it's less revision because you've already done it. And two, you know and you are familiar with um, what you can add into it. And then you've got non-scientific studies and theories. And again, you can bring in many, many different theories and studies here. So I've just put a few examples. Freud's case studies, um, can a study of 11 autistic children, Bowlby, Kohlberg, Isink's personality theory and Myers and Dinah. And then in the theories, you have got the refrigerator mother theory, dysfunctional families, the schizophrenogenic mother, but also Freud's tripartite personality, that id, ego, superego. So they're all things that you can also bring into this argument. OK, so should psychology be classed as a science? 
one of the arguments for this is that it is very beneficial. OK. This is a controversy over whether psychology should be considered a science. Psychology is a relatively new subject discipline and it is often struggled to be taken seriously as one of the traditional science subjects such as biology, chemistry and physics. If psychology was to be regarded as a science, then it would help us in three different ways. It helps us to think about what psychology is and how it should be done, so it gives us a structure. It's likely that the subject could have a greater status and people could favour the outcomes of psychology if it was very scientific. And it would also attract more funding, more funding for more research if they know that the research has a scientific basis and provides us with falsifiable evidence. OK, so a little bit more um, information here about how psychology benefits society. So the use of the scientific approach in psychology is important because, like I said, it provides evidence. For example, people might claim that men are more aggressive than women or that a certain drug cures depression, but we would need evidence to support those claims. For this reason, in the 19th century, early psychologists sought to create a science of psychology, of psychology in order to produce verifiable knowledge. So we wanted questions about human behaviour to have evidence. OK, um, and I'm sure you've all heard of Wilhelm Wundt and he developed the first psychology lab. Using this evidence based data makes research more useful to society, both ethically and economically. So it would not be ethical to give somebody a drug for depression without some certainty that it is effective. And so we need to do the research so that it could benefit people, benefit society um, ethically, knowing that it's not going to cause any psychological harm if we do give it to them. Economically, psychoactive drugs have saved billions of pounds a year in England alone compared to the use of psychotherapies. So if we do the research, we know it works, then it's great for the economy because it saves lots of money. Studying behaviour in a scientific way and providing evidence to explain and predict the behaviour has lots of benefits, not only to the individual, but also to society. Watson and Rayner's explanations of phobias, so remember that's the little Albert study. Lofters and Palmer's conclusions regarding eyewitness testimony and biological theories to explain ASD, schizophrenia or criminal behaviour. They all help us. They have that positive application and essentially they give us knowledge to help us deal with the situation, help us deal with that behaviour. But what, what about the costs then? One of the big things um, surrounding the, the cost of psychology is whether it is uh, deterministic or not. And I'm sure that you have heard the term determinism, determinist, deterministic um, quite a lot in psychology. It comes up a lot within your studies and when you're evaluating different approaches. The scientific approach is deterministic as it aims as its aim is to identify causes of behaviour and demonstrate cause and effect relationships. So if we know the cause of something, we will know how it affects something else. OK, and we can also treat it. That's what determinism means. It means that one thing determines another. So such understandings enable us to control and predict our world, but may also misrepresent it because the idea of simple determinism may be misleading when studying behaviour. So, for example, there, if we know that um, dysfunction in your prefrontal cortex, the very front of your brain, could lead to aggressive behaviour, that is, a cause and effect relationship. However, we know that criminals 
have the nature aspect and the nurture aspect. So they could have something in their environment or their upbringing um, that may cause them to do that um, criminal behaviour. So yes, OK, it allows us to look at cause and effect, but it doesn't look at lots of different factors that interact with each other that cause a certain behaviour. OK, so it's lacking a holistic view of something. This means that systems don't always obey simple cause and effect principles. Lots of behaviours have lots of different determinants that influence it. Trying to produce cause and effect answers in psychology is quite misleading and often doesn't represent what actually happens. Do we also need to consider free will when we are explaining human behaviour? Well, yes, we do because people have the ability and they are able to um, create their own future and their own um, situations and they should be able to act how they want to. So it's a tricky one, but it's definitely something that's nice to debate within an essay. Something else you can also bring into this is reductionism, reductionist. The scientific approach is also reductionist because it seeks to identify single variables that can be manipulated, which means breaking complex behaviours down into an individual element. Some psychologists do not see the value of this in gaining psychological insights. And there's a little bit of research here. Lang in 1965 argued that reductionist explanations of schizophrenia missed important elements of the disorder, such as the distress experienced by the patient. So again, you've got to look at lots of different factors that influence behaviour. Such psychologists prefer, like I said before, a more holist approach, a more holistic, looking at lots of things around the person and how they've influenced that behaviour. This approach focuses on systems as a whole rather than in separate parts and suggests that we cannot predict how the whole system will behave just from a knowledge of an individual components. Focus on general, so more holistic, rather than the individual now. So again, Leng claimed that the aim of the scientific approach is to make generalizations about behavior. That's the nomothetic approach. Whereas he felt that treatment could only succeed if each patient was treated as an individual, so more ideographic, meaning that if somebody has schizophrenia, everybody's form of schizophrenia may be different because of the situation, their environment, the triggers, uh, the structure of their brain. So when we look at treatment, we shouldn't make these generalizations about behavior we need to look at the individual and their needs. This suggests that the scientific approach may not be suitable for at least some of the concerns of psychologists. So you couldn't scan somebody's brain that has schizophrenia and say, right, well, in order to be treated, they need this, this and this. Yes, that's helpful, but it doesn't take into account their environment, their nurture. So for example, again, scienti scientific approach to treating mental illness, such as the use of a psychoactive drug, have had the best modest success, which suggests that the goal of science are not always appropriate. So there's lots and lots of things to consider um, generally, socially, within the environment and also the individual. OK, so we've looked at some of the benefits of um, psychology being a science and we've also looked at some of the costs. Moving on now to look at some of these methodologies used by various approaches. Okie dokie, so these are your approaches that you have looked at in AS and we can consider the changing methodologies used within psychology but we can also consider the link between the approaches and your scientific methodologies. Each of the major approaches in psychology are linked to certain methodologies. 
with some being more scientific than others. Some just lend themselves to being more scientific than others. And all of these approaches um, and the studies and the methodologies used within them can be brought into an answer here. So starting off with um, the biological approach, laboratory experiments we used, RAIN used brain scans, well, PET scans um, and cortical peel and box technique to look at the brains of murderers. Um, there's also uh, genetic research using twins and family studies that can be brought into the biological approach. We know, don't we, generally that the biological approach is the most scientific approach. Then you've got the behaviourist approach. So as behaviourists believe that there are only quantitative differences between humans and animals. They advocate studying animal learning and then they apply it to a human. So behaviourists also endorse the use of lab experiments. So you have got your forms of learning, classical and operant conditioning, and they were done using a rat and dogs with Pavlov and Skinner and they were in a lab, they were a controlled environment. So very scientific. The issue is they then applied that to a human without really testing on a human. So there's a bit of a grey area there, isn't there? The cognitive approach experiments uh, are often again in a lab setting. The multi-store model of memory is very, very scientific and uh, evidence based. Make inferences about what is going on in somebody's mind. Case studies of abnormal individuals are also used. Brain scans more recently used within cognitive neuroscience. So that whole idea of understanding consciousness um, and TDCS machines within um, neuro enhancement. That's quite new cognitive psychology, isn't it? The positive approach probably obviously not very scientific generally, um, but you can really bring in the differences within these methodologies. So use of meta-analysis within Myers and Diners research, questionnaires and interviews. And then you've also got the psychodynamic approach here. So that case study approach, uh, little hands um, and including those semi-structured interviews. So yes, Lots of psychology is scientific, but not all. But is there more to science than just a laboratory experiment? Just because you've done it in a laboratory experiment, does it mean it's classed as science? The ideal place for scientific research is the lab because you can control it, can't you? You've got those um, control over the independent the dependent variable and control over possible extraneous variables. So other factors that may affect somebody's behaviour. Controlled experimental research is the ideal of science because it can demonstrate a cause and effect relationship. And that's it really. That's the bottom line of this, isn't it? If it's controlled and in a lab and scientific, then it demonstrates cause and effect and instantly it's science. However, it is not only experiments that are conducted in a lab. A sleep re researcher might observe sleep patterns in a sleep lab, such as, you know, using observational techniques, um, and they're designed to be systematic and objective. But then you've got the whole idea of ecological validity and the issue of that and the fact that it's not natural. And are you really looking at the behaviour? if you are wired up to a sleep lab. It's not normal sleep. So is that evidence justifiable if they've not really slept how they normally would? The key point is that scientific research does not depend solely on labs and experiments. It does rely on systematic and objective methods of data collection. So even though an observation or a questionnaire, not the most scientific, However, you could have a, um, a Likert scale on a questionnaire and you can create some nice quantitative data from it. And that's an objective method. 
of data collection. So that is scientific. Even Freud can be argued as being a little bit objective. So his original research relied on his subjective interpretation. So it was him, it was what people said to him and he interpreted their dreams, didn't he, and their behaviour. However, more recent research has provided a little bit more of an objective foundation for some of his major ideas. So for example, Freud proposed that dreams are the unconscious fulfillment of wishes. So you dream about things that you wish would happen um, that you can't satisfy within your conscious everyday life. But in Freud's language, the ego becomes suspended whilst the id is given free reign. This is when you're asleep. And Mark Soms used PET scans to try and see if there was any scientific evidence to back up Freud's theory. And they examined brain activity in relatively normal individuals and they looked at that rational part of the brain um, during REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And the centres concerned with memory and motivation are very, very active. And the scans indeed showed that the brain areas to do with that rational conscious thought are inactive which means that maybe the uh, id does take over when you're asleep because we know that the rational conscious thought is your ego, isn't it, in the middle? And if your ego um, doesn't work or is inactive, then maybe your id does take over. So there is a little bit of evidence there um, that Freud's theory is a little bit objective. OK, moving on then to look at this changing nature of science. It may seem to be something um, that is static, but actually it has been changing over thousands of years, going back to early Greek. Um, the Greeks proposed the idea that science should be evidence based. Since that time, there have been many different developments in the process of science, so improving its objectivity and its validity. Psychology has also changed significantly over the last few centuries. It was viewed as a philosophy to the development of that biological psychology, to then Freud's work within the unconscious mind, and then the introdu uh, introduction of cognitive psychology, this humanistic and Maslow's hierarchy, and then obviously more recently, positive psychology. So there is a lot of development in psychology and that means that yeah it may develop further as um, scientific equipment develops etc. In psychology there's been two recent changes. One concerns the type of behaviour being studied so it's subject matter and we know that behaviour and especially the view of mental illness has changed massively and been updated a lot with um, various versions of the DSM. So positive psychology in particular has sought to change the focus of psychological research. The primary focus of this approach is on positive aspects of human nature, the good qualities that people have and how these qualities can be nurtured. Many researchers believe that as a discipline, psychology has been dominated by a focus on pathology, so understanding mental illness, and that a shift is needed in order to understand how many people flourish as individuals. Seligman, Martin Seligman, who is the guy that created this positive psychology movement, said that psychology has this negative view on human behaviour. As soon as you see somebody behaving against the norm, it's automatically, well, what's wrong with that person? How can we treat that person? And there's never this positive aspect or this positive outlook on behaviour. And maybe, yeah, we do need to shift it. And positive psychology aims to do that um, and aims to change the subject matter. So there is definitely development that could be had here to maintain its uh, scientificness, but also what it actually we um, looks at. Okay, 
So these are the arguments for psychology as a science. Again, this is open. These essays are open for you to bring in your own knowledge that you've learned throughout these two years. These are on the screen are just some examples. So the improved status, the funding and the structure, evidence based subject providing important evidence. So the, the use of drugs, genetics, eyewitness testimony. Um, proposes theories and generates a hypothesis that are tested, so they are falsifiable. That scientific methods so lab experiments and again, bring in those lab experiments that you know of. The use of scientific equipment, so EEG, electroencephalogram and MRI scans. Measuring the effect of the IV and the DV and controlling those extraneous variables. Objectivity, studies collect quantitative data that is not based on personal opinion, then it's quite nice um, to analyse. Replicability, highly controlled experiments. You've got methods of becoming more scientific, so bringing in SOMS and the idea of Freud and how it's more objective. And this nomothetic approach allows laws to be formulated which can predict behaviour. And then you've got again the arguments against. So like I said before, bring in other arguments. These are just some suggestions that I've come up with. Psychology does not have a paradigm, does not have a shift. Psychologists uh, study people. They should not be investigated in the same way as atoms or chemicals as people are all different and unpredictable and everybody has something different going on, whereas atoms and chemicals relatively stay the same. Subjectivity behaviour is often measured by people, so it's, you know, it can be interpreted differently, so it's subject to different biases. Difficult to control all extraneous variables, so it means that we have a lack of validity. Observations, field studies, case studies, they lack control and they're quite hard to replicate. Much of what psychologists are interested in is not observable. The mind, motivation and emotions is difficult to actually see because we don't know where the mind is. We can't scan a brain and look at somebody's mind. And then you've got the scientific research is deterministic and reductionist and then the nomothetic approach at the end. Again, these are just some suggestions. On the screen now, you can see that there are some example exam questions that have come up in in past years. So for psychology to have an impact, it is necessary for psychology to be a science is the quote that you would have to refer to. And then there are different, very specific um, elements of a question. So discuss to the extent in which you agree with the statement above. With reference to the above statement, discuss the costs and the benefits. So that would be your argument for and against. With reference to the above statements, discuss the changing nature of science. So the fact that we have that timeline and it's gone from um, Freud to cognitive and positive and the whole um, shift and change. And then with reference to the above statement, discuss the methodologies used in psychology. And that is where you would bring in the evidence I have um, spoken about with your different studies and theories from both AS and A2 psychology. On the screen now, you have got a possible essay structure. Now this essay structure would lend itself quite nicely to any of these questions. The important thing again is that you are linking this back to the question and no matter what your question is of these four, there is space on this essay structure for you to conclude what you're saying, but then link it to the question. So you'd start with an introduction to the controversy, say what it is, say what science is, say the differences. You can also say about what a controversy is. What are the two sides? Why is it controversial? What is the science? Does psychology fit this overall general criteria? And then you've got three different arguments. 
argument one, psychology is a science because it uses scientific methods, lab experiments. Methods are changing to become more scientific. Bring in those studies. Then you've got your counter argument. What about low ecological validity? Is it useful to scientific research if it's not within a natural environment? Not all of the methods are scientific. Do we need to change the subject matter of psychology? Do we need to enhance it? Then a little conclusion and again linking back to that question all the time, making sure that if it asks about validity in the question that you link your points to validity. Does it measure what it says it measures? Argument two, some approaches are more scientific and again working through those approaches from year 12. The history of psychology and, and you know the how far it's come and again a conclusion and a link to the question. And then argument three, benefits of psychology being a science. So making sure that it tells us a lot about human behaviour, it has very positive applications and a counter argument the cost of psychology being a science, the fact it's reductionist, it's deterministic and it's often nomothetic and bringing in that evidence I've spoken about today. And then again, a conclusion and a link to the question. And then you can, if you want to, have a bit more of an overall conclusion um, just to tie it all up. But again, like I said, um, linking to the question is super, super important. Okie dokie. Um, all of the PowerPoints and the essay structure will be available after this session, along with a recording that you can ask, access um, on the um, eOSCOL Twitter um, and also on YouTube. So you can rewatch this back um, to help formulate your controversy on scientific status. Um, that's it from me. If there are any questions, um, feel free to pop them in the question box, um, but I will pass you back over to our facilitator.